There is no doubt that NASA's Space Launch System is an impressive sight, having completed its first Artemis mission at the end of 2022. Unfortunately, it's been the only launch system in over a decade of rocket development so far. Combined with technical issues and severe cost overruns, it's not an exaggeration to say that the SLS program has been quite the mistake for NASA. Despite this, officials remain determined to continue the program at all costs. So what risks could this pose for the future of the U.S. space industry? If there were an alternative, who should NASA choose? Let's find out on today's episode of Alpha Tech. And thanks for watching us. Artemis II, officially scheduled for September next year, will be the first human journey to the vicinity of the moon since the last Apollo lunar landing mission in 1972. To prepare for this crucial mission, the most expensive and important core stage of the SLS rocket recently arrived at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, July 26th. The core is the backbone of SLS, and it's the backbone of the Artemis mission, said Matt Ramsey, NASA's mission manager for Artemis II. We've been waiting for the core to get here because all the integrated tests and checkouts that we have to do have the core stage. It has the flight avionics that drive the whole system. The boosters are also important, but the core is really the backbone for Artemis. So it's a big day. After that, the core stages will likely begin stacking with the rocket's two powerful solid rocket boosters on NASA's mobile launch platform in September. Each booster, supplied by Northrop Grumman, consists of five segments with pre-packed solid fuel and a nose cone. All components of the SLS rocket boosters are at Kennedy and ready for stacking. The SLS upper stage, built by ULA, is also at the Florida launch site. If NASA can accomplish this all this by the September deadline, the timeline for the lunar flyby mission in 2025 will seem reasonable. However, we cannot be certain of anything, as SLS has always been fraught with issues. Moreover, Boeing, the contractor responsible for producing the rocket's most crucial core stage, has recently caused several technical disasters in its various fields, including problems with aircraft engineering and, most notably, issues with the Starliner spacecraft. Currently, Starliner is still stuck on the ISS without a return date, and that raises concerns about the safety and reliability of the new rocket stage that just got delivered to the Space Center. While Starliner and the astronauts do have a rescue option available, being an LEO with SpaceX's Dragon capsule as a backup, the SLS and astronauts up there in space would have no such option for rescue at that time. SLS's rocket's core stage will accompany the spacecraft for most of the initial journey. Its impact should not be underestimated. If problems arise during the operation, the spacecraft deployment could fail. This situation could resemble the astrobotic mission earlier this year when launch issues led to the failure of the Peregrine lunar lander. And this is not our only concern. SLS is always the topic of debate. Many wonder whether it should be scrapped just due to its exorbitant costs. SLS is a very large vehicle. The initial version, reusing engines from the space shuttle program, will be capable of carrying 95 tons to LEO and 26 to the moon. A planned upgrade Block 2 variant will carry up to 130 tons to low Earth orbit. Big rockets are great, yeah, but the SLS program has never been really tied to any space exploration goals. At the time Congress funded SLS, there was no lunar mission to design for. Artemis program didn't come around until 2017. SLS, a rocket to nowhere. Eventually, though, the Space Launch System SLS rocket was completed to serve Artemis. Despite a successful test flight at the end of 2022, the project's been delayed. Initially slated for launch in 2017, SLS had extended delays and soaring costs. In total, the program has cost, get this, $23.8 billion, illustrating severe budget overruns in space exploration. To date, as the space market has shifted towards a new trend in the industry, lowering costs to make space technology accessible to more investors, NASA's space program has not been able to reduce prices. In fact, it remains extremely expensive. After the conclusion of the Artemis I mission, NASA proposed a solution to reduce LS launch costs by half by shifting to a service contract model. That report estimated the Block 1B version of SLS, which will be used starting with Artemis IV, will initially cost $2.5 billion per flight. A 50% cost reduction, according to Epoch, would mean SLS costs dropping to $1.25 billion per flight. 
The contract would be designed with Deep Space Transport, a joint venture between Boeing and Northrop Grumman, the two primary contractors for the rocket's components. However, NASA's Office of the Inspector General concluded that neither the cost reduction nor additional customers for SLS are likely to happen. This skepticism comes from reviews of lots more efforts to cut costs that have yet to achieve the expected savings, such as assembling the core stages for SLS and restarting RS-25 engine production. The report further noted that the lack of competition makes it difficult for NASA to negotiate cost reductions, in contrast to the competition seen in other launch services and commercial crew programs. OIG concluded that, based on its review of existing contracts and affordability initiatives, the cost of SLS will stay over $2 billion a vehicle for the first 10 launches under the EPOC contract. But who wants to spend over a billion dollars to launch anything on NASA's big rocket other than the agency itself? No one. The Space Force has outright refused to cooperate with NASA on the SLS system. The problem with the Space Launch System lies in its origins because President Barack Obama's cancellation of the Constellation program angered Congress on both sides of the aisle. NASA was obligated to enter into a Faustian bargain. NASA agreed to build a heavy lift rocket in exchange for the commercial crew program. Thus was born the Space Launch System, whose purpose was as much to provide jobs to constituents and, in fact, contracts to campaign contributors as it was to launch stuff up into space. NASA signed a specific type of contract with Boeing and other major suppliers for SLS. It's called a cost-plus contract, which financially drags down NASA when projects face cost overruns while still giving contractors additional payments or bonuses. Huh. This type of contract has been heavily criticized and is considered a disaster. Meanwhile, fixed-price contracts are more popular with a set price cap, like contracts NASA provided to Boeing and SpaceX for its commercial crew program. So, will NASA have to continue operating despite the future costs of SLS? Frankly, that's on them. They could abandon the SLS immediately because there's now many alternatives available. In fact, the private space industry has made major advances. It's like a lifeline for NASA with its expensive, unfinished space programs. SpaceX currently captures about 85% of the commercial launch market with its partially reusable Falcon 9. On a recycled booster, the listed price of a Falcon 9 launch is just $67 million and could drop further as boosters are recycled more frequently, up to 40 or 50 times. Launching on the triple booster Falcon Heavy has a listed price of $90 million. When Blue Origin completes its partially reusable orbital rocket, New Glenn, next year, the competition is going to heat up. New Glenn will have a payload lift of up to 45 tons to LEL, bringing it closer to Falcon Heavy and payload capacity rather than Falcon 9, and with a much bigger payload volume. This is an exciting competition, but a game changer will happen with SpaceX's Starship, which is set to begin carrying commercial payloads next year. It'll be lifting over 150 tons to LEO on SpaceX's Super Heavy booster. Unlike Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, or New Glenn, Starship's going to be fully reusable. Both the Super Heavy booster and the second stage Starship vehicle itself can land and fly again. Unlike SLS, Starship will be capable of on-orbit refueling, meaning it does not have to reduce payload size to get to higher orbits. A fully loaded Starship carrying more than 150 tons could launch to LEO, connect with another Starship full of fuel, and refuel. With a full tank starting in LEO, the first Starship could then carry its payload anywhere in the solar system. On-orbit refueling gives Starship a major performance advantage. Even the strongest Block 2 version of SLS, which isn't expected to be done until the 2030s, can only carry 45 tons just to the moon. If Starship succeeds, it will be capable of lifting more than three times the payload of the strongest SLS version to the moon without costing taxpayers and development funds. Complete reusability gives Starship a huge economic advantage over SLS. While the marginal cost of an SLS launcher is at least a billion dollars, maybe higher, SpaceX's Starship launch costs are going to be lower, potentially unbelievably low. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has said that he thinks there's a path to producing Starship and Super Heavy at a lower cost than Falcon 9. Using liquid methane as fuel instead of the usual RP-1 will help reduce fuel costs to just 900 grand a launch. Ultimately, reusability is the game changer in cutting costs. Overall, Musk hopes Starship's LEO launch cost will be less than one-tenth of Falcon 9 per kilogram.
Overall, the private space industry is thriving. Thanks to reusability, on-orbit refueling, and the economies of scale supported by long-term settlements, the low-cost human presence on the Moon and Mars is now within our grasp. That's why it's such a bummer that NASA's budget's getting used by contract to provide a handful of states with cushy jobs at traditional defense contractors under cost-plus contracts. NASA's human spaceflight programs are heading towards a ridiculous outcome. $2 billion is the cost per SLS launch, while new space companies like SpaceX offer similar capabilities at only a tenth of the cost or less. This is a huge waste of taxpayer money. Ultimately, it means we'll get much less space development for the money spent. Instead of a gateway to the moon, we could have a city on the moon. SLS Block 1 has flown. Now there's SLS Block 1B, but it's economically obsolete. In a sensible world, Congress would shut down that entire program, and NASA's space exploration would be continuing on commercial rockets. Unfortunately, that's not the world we're living in. Fortunately, the private sector is moving forward without billions of NASA's dollars. In a few short years, humans will set foot on the moon again, and then they'll go to Mars. Humanity's soon going to have cities in space. And when the history of this era is written, the record will show that the colonization of space occurred despite the government's frivolous waste of money on a rocket that no one wanted to use. And that's all for today's episode. Thanks so much for watching, and see you next time.